let me uh, first introduce uh, our very uh, distinguished group of uh, speakers. And I'm going to start with uh, Dr. Mahmoud Mohideen, even though he's the host of the entire series, but I will start with him nevertheless. He's the executive director at the International Monetary Fund. He's been the United Nations Special Envoy on financing the 2030 Sustainable Development Agenda since February 2020. Previously, he was Minister of Investment of Egypt and served as the World Bank Group Senior Vice President for the 2030 Development Agenda, uh, United Nations Relations and Partnerships. Uh, in February 2022, Dr. Mohideen was appointed by the Egyptian government as the Climate Action Champion at the 2022 United Nations Climate Change Conference. Uh, which aims at enhancing the communication between the Egyptian presidency and business and the private sector and all the international uh, organizations. It's a pleasure to have you, Dr. Mahmoud. Uh, then we have our keynote speaker, very important, Dr. Sifan Halagate. Uh, Dr. Stefan Halogate uh, is a senior climate change advisor at the World Bank. He joined the World Bank in 2012 after 10 years of academic research in environmental economics and climate science for Meteo France, the Centre International de Recherche sur l'Environnement et le Développement and Stanford University. His research interests include the economics of natural disasters and risk management, climate change adaptation, urban policy, uh, climate change mitigation and green uh, uh, growth. And uh, uh, he has a degree in uh, uh, engineering uh, in, in metrology and climatology uh, from the Université Paul Sabatier, Toulouse, and a PhD in economics from Ecole de Haute Etudes en Sciences Sociales Paris. Okay. Then we have. Uh, um, our commentator, Dr. Homi Haras, who is a senior fellow in the Center for Sustainable Development at the Brookings Institution in Washington, DC. In that capacity, he studies policies and trends influencing developing countries, including aid and development finance, the emergence of the middle class and poverty trends and global governance and the G20. He was at the World Bank for almost three decades in various positions, including chief economist of the East Asia and Pacific region. He served as the lead author of the high-level panel report on the post-2015 uh, development agenda, presented to the UN Secretary General on May 30th, 2013. He has authored multiple books, most recently, Breakthrough in 2022, and Leave No One Behind in 2019, and he holds a PhD in economics from Harvard uh, University. Uh, uh, last but not least, even though she is not here, uh, Dr. Yasmin Fouad, her ex Dr. Yasmin Fouad, Minister of the Environment. She is supposed to be with us as the uh, second commentator, but because of an urgent uh, uh, matter that she had to deal with related to COP as well, she couldn't, uh, she couldn't uh, make it today and she sends her sincere uh, uh, apologies. Uh, and uh, with us is Mr. Sharif Abdul Rahim the focal point uh, with the UN Secretariat of COP from Ministry of the Environment. He's, uh, he's, he's also uh, uh, with us representing uh, the ministry. Uh, having invited, having mentioned everyone and, uh, and a short bio that's never fair uh, in comparison to all what they do, I want to ask Dr. Mahmoud Mohideen uh, to start uh, for about four minutes introducing the series of lectures and their objective and, and maybe on the whole the effort uh, that's done by the uh, climate champion. Please, Dr. Mahmoud. Right. Um, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Abla, for uh, the kind introduction and uh, very grateful um, for the efforts and collaboration between um, the World Bank uh, Group. And uh, I'd like to thank uh, my good friends, uh, Marina West and uh, Steve Hammer for their hard work with their teams to get uh, this uh, series uh, together. And this is the first uh, of the series. And uh, happy that uh, uh, St Stefan is starting us um, off with his uh, uh, focus on uh, adaptation and the links between successful uh, 
uh, development and poverty reduction um, in uh, changing climate. This is the, uh, the title of his topic. I'm, uh, I'm very pleased that uh, this series is uh, bringing um, four important uh, think tanks, uh, research centers, and uh, leading um, institutions in, in Egypt, um, the Institute of National uh, Planning, uh, the Economic Research Forum, the Egyptian Center for Economic Studies, and uh, the Center for Economic and Financial Research. Uh, personally, I had all the pleasure uh, in working uh, closely in different capacities with the four entities during the last uh, uh, three decades, um, either as a research assistant with one of them, or uh, a senior economist in another, or a fellow with a third, and uh, a frequent visitor to, uh, to the fourth. And I'll leave you to, uh, to do the matchmaking um, on these activities. That, that will not be a puzzle um, uh, for the COP. We have more important puzzles uh, to solve as going to be discussed in this series. But um, I think the first objective is to appreciate science, evidence, and serious research when we are talking about policies. And um, we are in a very important um, um, uh, juncture here where science should be dominating the policy design, institution reforms, and prioritizing our objectives. As much as we can be evidence-based uh, with adequate data, with adequate knowledge, uh, that the policy advice at national, regional, or global level um, would be very much um, appreciated. And um, what I like on this COP, I hope, is not just to have a good, uh, decent ar arrangement and good events uh, during uh, uh, the, um, uh, the COP and the, uh, the meetings uh, during uh, Sharm Sheikh events. This is expected, and many colleagues are working hard from the state side led by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Ministry of Environment, and the whole of government actually is working hard to prepare us better uh, for uh, the, in terms of logistics, arrangements, and a, a, an extensive um, uh, program. But what I like to resonate with us is more of the kind of work that we are uh, going to be observing today and being part of, how to engage in research and science and to provide uh, 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 different scenarios and solutions uh, to the policy makers. And here policy makers are not just the government officials, but uh, representing the non-state actors, uh, business society, civil society, think tanks and researchers. This issue of, of providing information for understanding better the priorities is going to be very much dominating the discussion going forward. So, um, and uh, more collaboration between these institutions uh, with the likes of the World Bank and others that could really be um, helpful. Of course, in this meeting, uh, my very good friend, Homi Haras, with his different affiliation, including with Brookings, is bringing another um, uh, dimension and channel of collaboration going forward that I like uh, all of my friends in the four research centers and think tanks to build on in reaching out, in identifying possible uh, collaboration of research, which is already starting. Um, Homi and his colleagues and Brookings are uh, finalizing an important um, uh, volume on, on climate, and they were kind uh, to invite uh, me and uh, Dr. Hal Abu Ali and a third uh, author with us to um, uh, Amira to uh, finish a chapter on Egypt, and uh, this just um, where Dr. Hala and our uh, co-author Amira did the heavy lifting on that chapter, but this is a kind of an example that I can encourage my colleagues in different institutions um, um, to bring local knowledge, uh, domestic uh, uh, priorities, and political economy understanding, and to bring that to the global to glo the global scene. But, so this is the first uh, part is basically about the importance of this kind of collaboration. The second that I'm very happy when I flip through the presentation prepared to us by Stefan, that it is confirming one of the main priorities of uh, COP27, that we cannot really have but a holistic approach in dealing with climate action. There is no value for cl our climate action that can really result in deterioration of poverty or compromising improvements in living standards or having a negative impact on the labor market. We have already enough of that 
pre-COVID, after COVID, pre-Ukraine and after Ukraine. And when we have all of these crises affecting our lives and livelihoods, we need to be mindful to any kind of policy action that could be designed with all of the uh, good intentions, but it may have unintended consequences. And I, I can claim that a reductionist approach to climate had really resulted in negative results on sustainable development without achieving much on the climate action front. So it's very much about time to have a more holistic approach to get climate action within sustainable development framework and push that agenda forward, especially in developing economies and emerging markets. And many of the evidence shared with the staff, with Stefan is basically confirming um, this kind of the need of establishing links between poverty reduction, SDG1, climate action, and putting that all within sustainable development. The third area, which is again encouraging me perhaps to revisit a topic that Homi and I spoke about before, is basically the implications of all of that on policies, especially on climate finance and whether climate finance should be, which is my argument, part of the overall development finance coordination or not. I think one of the major policy implications, and I may have a chance at the end to come back to this, um, this uh, in the discussion, that one of the major implications on how to design the climate finance agenda to be more consistent and building on what, what we understand better on the development finance. But this is a very interesting, very contentious argument as well, and gets us beyond the 100 billion since Copenhagen, gets us beyond the 0.7% of GNI. This is a topic that's going to be discussed at length at, at the COP based on a piece prepared by Nick Stern, Vera Songui, and many uh, scholars, including actually Homi for that. So without uh, taking more of the time and already beyond the four minutes uh, um, uh, suggested by our third moderator, um, I, I like to go back to the room, um, uh, thanking you all for doing that. Uh, uh, and I hope and I pray to you all that you build in this uh, uh, discussions and the engagement that you have been having. There are many people who have been behind the scene, including my good uh, friend, Dr. Shereen, who um, named the teams uh, behind uh, the work of uh, Dr. Ashraf Al-Arabi, Dr. Harabu Ali, uh, Dr. Ibrahim Al-Badawi, and Dr. Um, uh, Adla, um, as well uh, from the Faculty of Economics and Political Science. And behind all of these names, many people have been really working hard and through this collaboration, not just at the leaders level of this institution, but the many researchers, assistants working hard on that, we like this kind of collaborative work to produce what we need of evidence-based support for policies for climate, sustainable development, and their finance. Thank you so much, and uh, looking forward to the discussion. Thank you, Dr. Mahmoud. Thank you, thank you very much. And I intentionally let go of the four minutes for your sake, because it's the first line in the series, and you had to have the chance to to say what you what you had in mind behind it. So it's a, it's a, it's always a pleasure. Plus, of course, you touched upon very important uh, points that will definitely come up uh, um, uh, in the discussion. Uh, now we move on to you, uh, Stefan. Please, with your uh, presentation. So please, uh, you have twenty five minutes. Thank you very much. And so. Can you hear me or should I take the hand mic too? Yeah, I should do that. And now it's better, right? Okay. So first, uh, let me thank everybody for uh, having me here. Um, it's, uh, it's really a pleasure. Let me remove this because maybe the reason. It's a real time, uh, real time technical problem solving. Okay. There we go. So I was thanking you, all of you, for being here and for having me here, um, especially a few weeks before the start of the uh, COP27. It's, uh, it's really uh, a pleasure to be giving this talk. Uh, it's also my first trip in Egypt, so uh, it's uh, even more of a pleasure for me to be here. I hope I can get a glimpse of all of your treasures on, uh, on my way back, but I really appreciate the, uh, the opportunity, and I'm really looking forward to the discussion we can have after my, my presentation. Uh, because on all of these issues, and I want to start with that, we don't have all of the answers. And only by, by discussing those challenges and those opportunities, uh, we can reach the, uh, the consensus that we need to make progress. Uh, it's also great to discuss this topic, climate change and development, 
uh, right now before the, the COP because your COP is taking place in a very special time. Um, the World Bank published a report five days ago acknowledging that poverty reduction has stalled. For the last few years, it has stopped decreasing, which it did for decades before. We also face higher interest rates, higher price for food and energy. Uh, so today we really cannot look at climate change without looking at development at the same time. And that's really what I would like to discuss with you today. But when I, when I do that, um, I want to do that by starting with what I see is as the main challenge and the main imperative that we have to face. Um, and this imperative is what I would call the adaptation imperative. Um, yeah. So this challenge is the first one, if you think about climate change and development, that we should really look into it. How do we make sure we achieve our development objectives, including poverty reduction, in the context of a changing climate? Which means, this is a picture from, from Vietnam, for instance, with more and more um, disasters affecting coastlines, but we all have in mind what happened in, the, in Pakistan in the last few weeks with about 30% of the country in the water. So how do countries like Pakistan reach their development goals in, in that context? And it's, of course, a lot about resilience and about adaptation to climate change. And I could talk quite a lot about the impact of climate change on GDP and economic growth. Um, and this is something that we see already and that we can look into in the future. What you see on this figure is an extract from our recent country climate and development reports on, on the Sahel. Um, those reports, by the way, are new diagnostics that the World Bank has started to do this year. Uh, we have already published CCDLs for nine countries and we will do more than 20 by the COP and then we will do all of the countries where we're active uh, with the objective of really bringing development and climate together in our planning and in our own portfolio. And here you have an example of the type of analytics that you'll find in those reports, looking at how climate change impacts will affect growth and development in five countries in the Sahel. And you see impacts minus 10% in some countries with the adaptation recommendations that we're making in those reports. This can be reduced uh, maybe around 5%, but the point I want to make here is that those numbers, looking at GDP and aggregate growth, might be missing the main story. Because the main story is not at the aggregated level. The main story is about people. And if we really want to understand the impact of climate change on development, on poverty, we have to start from people and how they are affected. And this is why what I would like to do now is to start from what poor people are telling us image from a household survey um, which we're doing in, in most countries and in those household surveys more and more we're asking people why do you fail to exit poverty why did you maybe fall back into poverty since the last time we did this interview and we just listen to what these people have to say about what is in the way what prevent them to exit poverty and they tell us and there's no fancy modeling here they're just people telling us about three things in most of those surveys. One is the role of food prices and loss of income from agriculture and the environment. Another reason that they give us for why it's difficult to exit poverty is the 